All right, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So today we're going to be talking about evolution and we're going to talking a little bit about systematics and then we're going to have a brief exercise together. Well, you're going to have a brief, brief group exercise. Um, <clears throat> I'll break you guys off into groups and you'll, you'll talk amongst each other about some evolution problems. So um, just as a couple of um, announcements, let me just share my screen. Just give it a second. There it goes. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, just as a couple of reminders. So obviously, I was sick last class. So again, I um, I do apologize for the brightness of the canceled class, but I felt like I was dying, and I didn't really have any other choice. Um, you had um, homework last week, and there was extra credit discussion board as well that was due last week. In terms of this week, um, the sort of the main thing is you have a homework assignment. It's going to be due on Sunday. So it's up there and it'll for you on Blackboard. It's going to be on what we on what we're covering today uh, in class. In addition, you should be looking to form your groups for your bio wiki and submit a project proposal. So I noticed that many of you um, have done that, and that's great. So you know, just as a refresher where to go, if you go to weekly modules, you go to week three, and you go to bio wiki group sign up, it will take you to a Google Sheet. And you can sign up for a group. Now, if you have uh, a friend, like some of you have, great. Like this group, fantastic. Um, I see two people are looking, so maybe it may suggest that uh, the two folk link up with one another and join, join forces. But if you have not signed up for your group yet, please just, again, you got you to gotta do it. <laughs> you got to do it uh, at some point, and you have an assignment due that you have to write a proposal on it, right? So uh, you have already suggested a topic and I've said that's okay. I thought this one was kind of odd, but if that's what you want to do, by, by all means, do it. Um, and so just remember to do it. And uh, again, in terms of, uh, if you don't remember sort of what goes into this problem, this um, project, there's a project description here, there's an example, and here's the submission information for your BioWiki proposal. Um, here's what you need to, to submit this, um, and it is due, just to make sure I'm giving you the exact correct date, it is going to be due this Friday. So you have till midnight um, to do it. Though I may extend this date till Sunday. You know what, I'm just going to extend the date till Sunday. I'm just going to extend it right here. Let me edit you. I'm just going to extend it to Sunday, be nice. Let's see, it's going to come on, scroll down. Do date, and it's due Sunday. Okay, so you got till Sunday to do it. Make it a little bit, give you a little bit extra time to do it. So that just as a reminder, just remember, always, always, always make sure you check the set syllabus. Remember, this is a contract between you and I, well, me and all 23 of you, about what's due and when. And the other thing I just want to mention is I saw some of you have done your laboratory exercise. Great. Um, for those of you that have not done your laboratory exercise, please make sure you log on to the Labster, set up an account, and do your exercise. Remember, you can only do this exercise this week. If you do it any other week, you it will not count. Um, and the other thing I will mention about this Labster, if you did you know, if you didn't do as well on the Labster quiz as you thought you were going to do, remember, you can do this simulation as many times as you want. So just as an FYI. All right. Anybody have any questions before we get started for the day? Um, as always, you can raise your hand in the middle of the lecture. Um, you know, there's a button at the very bottom of your screen to raise your hand. Um, if you want to talk, you can feel free to talk. Or if you want to ask a question in the chat, you can ask a question in the chat. But let's dive into the topic of today, and this is going to be evolution and phylogenetics. And so I do things a little bit differently when I teach intro bio, and I do them a little bit differently because nothing in biology quite makes sense if you don't understand evolution. Evolution is the most key concept that you will learn from me. Um, 
uh, in it because it spans every discipline. You know, you might not use molecular biology or genetics in some disciplines, but evolution touches everything. So I like to start with it as opposed to, you know, diving into molecules or things like that. I like to lead with evolution. But life is <clears throat> big and small, right? It, it ranges from the biggest things that have ever lived, like blue whales, down to the teeniest, tiniest virus. And all organisms have many characteristics they share in common. This includes of being composed of one or more cell, the capacity to carry out metabolism, so get energy from food that they're consuming, transferring energy with ATP, which we'll talk about later this semester, and encode hereditary information in their DNA. And life has all these things in common, and it's and it's just sort of a thing that everything does. It's you know from a historical perspective, it's it was likely something everything had before life diverged and became very diverse. So the reason we all have these characteristics is because we're all based upon the same biology, and that biology evolved somewhere very early on, as we'll discuss. Now, life is tremendously diverse. There are five million plus species of animals on this planet, um, and they and they range from being complex and huge like humans or whales or simple like trees or bushes or teeny tiny like bacteria and viruses. Um, but no matter what science you're in, um, biologists group organisms based upon shared characteristics and molecular sequence data. And molecular sequence data just means your DNA sequences. And so this leads us to these two topics that we're going to discuss before we jump into evolution, because I think you need to understand phylogenetics before you can understand evolution. And we're going to talk about systematics and phylogenetics. Now, um, what these two topics are really getting at is getting at relationships between organisms um, based upon shared characteristics or uh, hypothesis about their shared relationship based on their characteristics or their DNA. Um, and so, again, Systematics is evolutionary relationships, and phylogeny is looking at a hypothesis of patterns about the relationship of between species. And again, phylogenies and systematics can be done based upon characteristics or DNA sequences. Now, we do this because fossil records are incomplete. When we, when we try to trace the lineage of, say, a horse, which we'll discuss later in this class, we don't find all the intermediate species in between the modern horse and ancestral horses. We have to rely on co the capacity to um, estimate what happened in the past by using both systematics and phylogenetics. So I'm going to I'm going to pose you a question. Um, so this is a multiple choice. So this is just going to be question one. And just want to know A or B. What do you guys think? What is what do you think is more accurate for reconstructing a relationship between two species? DNA which would be A, or traits, AKA physical features. It's a tough question to answer. And this is a, this is a question scientists have wrangled with for a long time, but I'll pose it to you because it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. What is more accurate? If I was trying to say, what's the relationship between humans and chimpanzees, do I use my DNA or do I use my traits, AKA physical features? Just as a reminder, guys, your participation grade is included by you answering questions. So if you don't answer this, you're getting knocked by on your participation grade for this day, just as a note. That's what I thought. <laughs> The overwhelming majority of you say there, that you could use DNA as opposed to traits to estimate relationships between two species. And that's not a terrible answer. I think that's probably, of the two options, is probably the most accurate. Um, because your DNA encodes for everything about you, right? And we'll discuss DNA in depth, but your DNA, it tells you what you are, right? And for any underlying trait, so for any uh, physical trait, like your height or your eye color, there's an underlying DNA sequence. So it's usually more accurate, not always, to reconstruct phylogenetic trees based upon DNA or phylogenetic relationships based upon DNA. 
But historically speaking, we used to do it based upon traits. Uh, modern, modern technology allows us to compare DNA sequences. Now, phylogenetics as a field, so this comparative uh, evolutionary theory started with Charles Darwin, and we're going to talk about Charles Darwin again in this class because he's a really important character in the history of evolution, but Darwin really envisioned that all species were descended from a single common ancestor. And the way he tried to draw this, as you can see over here, um, very sort of famous tree, and his also famous uh, little, little uh, uh, quote here is, I think, um, I think this, it's just as a, if you ever see anyone with a tattoo that says, I think, they're a big nerd and they like Darwin. <laughs> um, but this is what he envisioned, that there was some sort of ancestor and each one of these ends, as we'll talk about, was a species, but they all descended from some ancestor way back in time. And he depicted this relationship of descent with modification, so things changing through historical time via a phylogenetic tree. So let's talk about how we go into doing this. So this is a phylogenetic tree, and this is one of the more important trees we're ever gonna look at as uh, scientists in this class. So the question we're gonna ask, how do we interpret a phylogenetic tree? How do we interpret this tree? So let's talk about some anatomy of a tree before we get back to talking about this very important tree. So the interpretation of a phylogenetic tree is pretty simple but some people can get tripped up about how to interpret certain things. Now, what we have here is we have species A, B, C, D, and E, and these are species of interest. And this is, as you can see, this is just a phylogenetic tree. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's got branches, it's got tips, right? This is what a phylogenetic tree looks like. Now, each one of these ends, so we have species A and B, these are what we call our tree tips. Anytime you see uh, essentially uh, this horizontal line split into two horizontal lines, we call this a branch point or a node. And then anytime you see horizontal space, this is what we call the tree branches. Now, the important thing here is this branch length. This horizontal branch length is ultimately what matters the most. When we look at a tree, we're interested in how much horizontal branch length there is between species A in species B or species A and species E. We do not care about this vertical branch here at all. This simply does not matter. This is just a way of depicting the tree um, and drawing it. It has no influence on interpreting the, the relationship between species A and species B. And so if we're trying to interpret this relationship between any two species, all we have to do is count is essentially measure the branch length between two species. So species A and species B here, we measure this branch length and then we measure this branch length. We add that up together, and that gives us some number. And the smaller that number is, the more closely related those two species are. Now, this is in direct contrast to comparing species A to species E, where you have to sum this branch, this branch, this branch, and then this big long branch here. Now, I hope just visually you can see that's much bigger in terms of a, a if you were to take a ruler to that in terms of length than comparing A to B or even A to C, right? So this is, this is how we interpret a tree. It's all about that horizontal branch length. The more of it there is, the greater the difference in the species are, whether it's at the DNA level or it's at the trait level. And it's important to note when you have two species here, this is what, so say we have a, a and B uh, grouped together, we would call this what's called a clade. That's another common term you'll see for interpreting phylogenetic trees. Two species, or say if we had a third species here, we'd call this a clade, just as an anatomy thing. So this is the phylogenetic tree. It's how we interpret it. Does anybody have any questions before we sort of move on? It's a, I don't know, not a complex answer, but a, um, it's a, it's, if you haven't read a tree before, it's kind of a weird thing at first. Okay, so let's um, let's move on. Let's move back to this tree. How do we interpret this phylogenetic tree? Well, it's color coded by the three means of life: bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, and it shows the evolutionary and phylogenetic relationship between these three big groups. So we live over here in the eukarya, we're animals, and archaea and bacteria. So there's two things we can interpret from this tree. The first being um, is actually kind of an interesting one, is that eukaryotes 
are much more similar to archaea than archaea are to bacteria. That's the first thing that you get that our most recent common ancestor in the microbial world is is archaea. So that's the first key takeaway. The second key takeaway is that there was some last universal common ancestor. So down here at the bottom that I've circled here in red, there was some organism that existed way, way back in evolutionary time. You know, you're talking a billion or so years ago, or I should probably say about, a, about 2 billion years ago or so. Um, and this organism was the last common ancestor that was shared between bacteria, archaea, and, eu archaea and eukaryotes. And what happened is this organism just evolved. It got into a new environment and it changed over time, leading to the rise of our bacteria, our archaea, and our eukaryotes. So this is how we interpret tree like this. We're looking at relationships. And again, we can say, OK, animals are mo more closely related to fungi than they are to plants. That's one another thing you can interpret interpret from this. Or maybe you can say this type of bacteria is more closely related to this type of bacteria than this type of bacteria. But again, it's all about that branch length. Um, I'll just make one note. This tree is going vertically, as you you know, like this. This tree was going horizontally. It's the same tree. You can rotate any tree any which way you want. It doesn't matter. The interpretation is still the same. It's all about that branch length. So the question we should ask now is how do we physically make a tree? And making a tree, looking at that last one or any of the ones we've looked at thus far, it's all about similarity between two species or multiple groups of species with respect to your DNA, physiology, morphology, behavior, or traits. So you can use any one of these five things to construct an evolutionary relationship, a phylogenetic tree, to compare any number of organisms together. So we're going to use an example here. We have uh, seven organisms. We have a lamprey, a shark, a salamander, a gorilla, a tiger, and a human, and a cowboy lizard. But he's just a lizard. He just, he just got a sweet cowboy hat on. So how would we make a tree based on these organisms? Well, we can look at their DNA, but you know we're not, we can't really do that as a class. But what we can do is look at their morphology, or we can look at their traits. We can look at what shared characteristics these seven organisms have in common. And we can look at any number of things, right? We can look at where they live, right? So fins versus no fins, jaws versus no jaws, right? Hands versus no hands, right? Claws versus no claws. So any number of physical traits we can see in common between these to attempt to construct a phylogenetic tree. So let's 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 try this. So we have our seven organisms here on the left. See that are organisms, and then we have the traits we can compare on the the um, the top part of the table here. So we have jaws, lungs, uh, amniotic membranes. So these are um, you know uh, am, uh, you know having like a like um, uh, a membrane around your um, your your fertilized eggs, like humans do, like. Uh, um, like lizards do, and the so on and so forth. Uh, presence and absence of hair, tail or no tail, and whether you're bipedal or not. Now, what we can do is construct what we would call a similarity table, where the number one means that the organism possesses that derived character state, i.e. it has the trait, or a zero, which means it does not have that ancestral character state. So we can look at this. So lampreys have none of the things. Sharks just have jaws, but they have no, nothing else. Humans have all the characteristics. And then you can see there's some degree of, of, of presence and absence of these traits in this, right? So lizards have jaws and lungs and amniotic membranes, but they have no hair, no tail. Uh, well, they have tail. That's, that's odd. Um, I, use, I guess I used the wrong lizard here. I, just, I got so excited by the cowboy lizard that I used the wrong picture. But anyways, uh, and then they are not bipedal, right? So we can we can reconstruct this to then use this the presence and absence traits to try to construct a tree, and when you try to draw this tree, well, you can draw it based upon this table. So lampreys are the most different, right? They have none of those traits. So what we would do is we call our lamprey the outgroup because they lack none of the traits that we were talking about. Now, if we go back to this table, again, we have sharks just have jaws. And so they're, in comparison to the rest of these, they're the least similar. So they would come next. And so jaws were evolved here. And now everything above here has jaws. 
Uh, so, but sharks have none of the other traits, so sharks branch off here. Now we get to the next trait, which is lungs. Lung, excuse me, lungs evolved. And salamanders have lungs, but they have, again, salamanders have lungs, but none of the other traits. So the salamanders branch off here, and so on and so forth. So every time we reach a color, it's the presence of a new trait. And this trait is something nothing else before it have. So again, bipedal, that's only humans. Gorillas aren't bipedal, tigers, lizards, sharks, they're not bipedal. So we can use this trait data to try to construct a phylogenetic tree, which is just showing these evolutionary relationships and how it relates to overall traits. Because just visually speaking, you can see gorillas and humans are much more similar than tigers and humans. But at the trait level, we can see tigers are lacking two traits that humans have, but gorillas are only lacking one trait that humans have. So based upon this, this set of traits, we know that tigers aren't as similar to humans as gorillas are. And so this is, this is the way we go into making a tree. Again, it's all based upon how similar organisms are. But the idea being, if you shared a common ancestor, you're likely to have similar traits. So the idea being is humans and gorillas have a common ancestor, but that common ancestor is much more closely, uh, closely um, oriented them in modern evolutionary time than the ancestor of tigers and humans. And that you can see that again in this trait table, but you can also see it in the, 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 the distance we're looking at here in the phylogeny, right? The branch length is much longer between the tiger and the human. So that's how we interpret phylogenetic tree. This is how we draw one. It's, it's more complicated than that when you actually start to do it, but that's the basics that go into it. Now, we were talking about species, but the, first, the question we should ask in, is how do we define a species? And a, a scientist named Ernest Mayer defined a species as groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from, such, from, from other such groups. So the idea when you say something is a species, so when I say the human species is Homo sapiens, it's a species is composed of populations, which is just groups of the same species, whose members mate with one another and can produce fertile offspring. And when I say fertile offspring, that means the offspring of two humans should be able to go on, barring nothing crazy happens, to then produce its own offspring. That's what I mean by viable offspring. Um, but sometimes organisms are reproductively isolated, meaning they have lost the capacity or they cannot mate with one another or do not produce fertile offspring, meaning their offspring, even if they can make them, can't physically go on to make offspring themselves. Now, there's a couple uh, ways we can sort of define um, differences in species um, and separate species. Um, so we can look at prezygotic isolation mechanisms. And uh, these include ecological isolation, so they don't live in the same area. Uh, behavioral isolation, so, you know, the best example of this is birds uh, doing mating dances. So some birds need special mating dances or calls, which means if you don't do them, you can't mate with that bird. Uh, temporal isolation, meaning I breed in the winter, you breed in the summer, thus we have no overlap and we thus can't breed together. Uh, we have mechanical isolation, and this is like, this is um, looking at like uh, genitalia. Uh, I bet you guys didn't know you were looking at genitalia <laughs> over on the right side of this, but you are. Um, sometimes genitals don't match up. And so this is a bunch of marine mammals, and you can see the genitalia of marine mammals just don't match up. And because they don't match up, well, they, uh, a, harbor, a harbor porpoise can't mate with a bottlenose dolphin because of, again, differences in the mechanics of how they mate. Now, there are other things. So um, there's this issues of preventing of gamete fusion. And so these are what we call post-zygotic isolating mechanisms. So even if sperm and egg met, they physically couldn't merge together. So that's the, the gametes just are not um, compatible. And then finally, there's also what we call hybrid inviability or infertility. So for instance, the, uh, the liger, which is a, a hybrid between um, the tiger and the lion, uh, that can happen, that mating can happen, but a, but a liger, again, that mixture of a tiger and a lion is uh, essentially sterile and it can't reproduce offspring. Uh, another example of this would be the mule, right? A horse and a donkey can mate, but a mule is sterile. It can't produce more mules. But the 
Um, the definition of what defines a species um, is not perfect. Reproductive isolation, it might not be the only force that actually maintains species integrity. And there's also this problem of what we call interspecific hybridization. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of this, uh, it's um, just some of this weird genetics. Um, behind it. But the species definition itself isn't perfect, but we need a way to, if we're going to compare species, evolutionary speaking, um, we need to be able to call a species. And so this definition we have, and we just talked about, you know, the, the inability to mate and produce viable offspring isn't perfect, but it does work for most animals. Um, and it also doesn't work for microscopic organisms as well, because um, as you will learn, they don't, they don't actually physically mate, they just reproduce asexually. So the definition of a species um, is not perfect, but it works. Now, the, the, there is this idea of what we call an ecological species concept, which is each species is adapted to its own environment. And this is a relatively new idea. And this, this, this concept relies on the idea that distinctions between species are maintained by this force called natural selection. And we're going to talk about natural selection a lot coming up. So if you don't know what natural selection is now, don't worry, you will. Um, uh, selection, uh, the stabilization of artificial selection does maintain species adaptations, and hybrids are quickly eliminated from a gene pool. And in some cases, strong selection overwhelms gene flow, preventing any meeting between populations. So there is a different type of species concept, just as a note, uh, just so you know it exists. Um, well, if you take bio, uh, the second semester of general biology, you'll learn all about it again. But I just wanted to make it known now that there is two ways to call a species. But for the purposes of this class, we're going to be talking about this biological species concept of, you know, in, in, inability to physically meet. So what is natural selection? At the most basic level, it is what the it is the building block of evolutionary theory. But Natural selection is the environment selects for traits that are beneficial within a population. Now, it's important to note when we're talking about evolution, when we're talking about natural selection, we're talking about the evolution of populations. This is a really common misconception in evolutionary theory by people that you know, have never really studied in depth. An individual physically cannot evolve. I cannot evolve, you cannot evolve, my cat cannot evolve, right? No individual can evolve, but a population or a group of the same species physically can evolve. So a, the, the population of humans on the planet can evolve. The population of lizards in the American Southwest can evolve, but an individual cannot evolve. That's an important thing here. Now, the environment's um, natural selection, again, is the environment selecting for traits that are beneficial in a population. So from that, you should ask, what is a trait? And I've already sort of mentioned this, but it's any physical characteristic. So height, weight, you know, eye color, things like that. Any molecular characteristics, um, and we'll talk about these later in the semester. They include, you know, enzymes or proteins or cellular structures, or potentially behavioral characteristics. So that's a trait. Keep Always keep that in the back of your mind when, we, when you hear trait. Um, now, where did this idea come from? Well, it started with Charles Darwin in the 1850s. Um, and Charles Darwin also had a counterpart, um, Sir Alfred Wallace, um, who doesn't really get any uh, credit for the theory of evolution because Darwin published his findings first. So we're going to talk about Darwin a lot. But just to know, there was, there's, there's a decently long history of evolutionary theory. Like It dates back to about the 1200s when people started thinking about evolutionary theory. So it's not just an 1800s and on thing. It's something people have been thinking about for you know, eight or 900 years now, but it really took off with Charles Darwin in the 1850s. Now, the theory of evolution by natural selection, which is the theory proposed by Charles Darwin, provides a basis to explain the huge diversity of life on this planet. As I mentioned, there is 8.7 million species currently documented on this planet. We estimate there's about 15 million species as a whole. Um, this is what we estimate to be, we've likely driven many of them to extinction, but because humans are awful like that just as a just as a note but there is a lot of diversity of life on this planet now darwin never quite thought back this far but this also evolution as a theory does account um, for the evolution from microscopic to macroscopic life forms so going from that universal common ancestor that last one or luca that we saw in the phylogenetic tree to modern day eukaryotes prokaryotes archaea and bacteria 
So just as a note, it provides basis for how life evolved from simple to complex, and it provides how a mechanism for how there's so much diversity of life on this planet. It was, again, it was developed in the 1850s and was, and still frankly can be a controversial topic. Um, and it's typically speaking, it's um, in contrast to intelligent design, right? Where you have a deity or a de multiple deities, um, you know, you think about a god or many gods um, creating life on this planet in its current form, right? So it is, evolution as a theory is, is directly in contrast to that. But remember, as we talked about in the scientific um, thinking lecture a few weeks ago, a theory is a really strong line of evidence in science. So evolution is is a theory, but it is it is heavily, heavily supported. It's heavily, heavily vetted. Evolution is the theory of biology. It is, it is, there's no doubt in any biologist's mind that evolution is how things work on this planet. Um, just as a note, it's it's controversial in society, it's not controversial in science at all. It's like climate change, right? Climate change is controversial in politics, but not controversial to scientists. So um, Charles Darwin hopped on a uh, on a research voyage on the HMS Beagle in the 1840s, and uh, they sailed all around the world. So this is a map of Darwin. He's he's English, so they started in England. They went all the way down the South American coast, up around uh, the Cape of Hope. No, that's not the Cape of Hope. Um, the Magellan Straits. That's what that is. Um, all the way up the coast of America. They stopped at the Galapagos Islands, which we'll talk about. Um, very shortly, went all the way across the in, uh, across the Pacific Ocean, Australia, Madagascar, came back around of um, Africa, back to South America, and then back up to England. So this was a multi-year voyage. Um, also just, I don't know about you guys, but hopping on a sailboat and sailing around the world sounds, in 1850s terms, is sounds kind of scary to me at least, but that's just me. Um, and I, I, I mentioned this journey not because it's cool. Well, it is, it is kind of cool. It, and it's kind of impressive too. I think anyone that sails around the world has done something impressive. But um, what he saw in this journey, whether it was in Madagascar, whether it was in uh, Australia, but in particular, what he saw in the Galapagos Island formed his views on evolution as a, as a, a theory, as an idea. Now, most of Darwin's theory comes from what he saw in the Galapagos Islands. And so this is an island archipelago there is about uh, 13 islands. So this is the Galapagos Islands here. They vary in size. It's off the coast of Ecuador. So, uh, you know, you can see the Galapagos is about here on the world map. So it's not, um, it's not too far from the mainland, but it's just far enough that it's, you know, pretty isolated. And the Galapagos Island, if you've never seen a nature documentary on the Galapagos Islands, it is a wild place. It's a, it's a volcanic archipelago, so it's um, it's not really super active um, in terms of volcanoes right now, but it was by volcanoes. Um, and it has all sorts of wild and crazy animals you don't find anywhere else in the world. And they're wild. And they include uh, the Galapagos penguins, Galapagos seals, Galapagos tortoise, the marine iguana, and some other ones. Um, and they have this wild array of organisms that are just have some bizarre characteristics. Like, for instance, the marine iguana, unlike every other iguana on the planet, which lives in trees and bushes and stuff like that, the marine iguana lives on this island and dives into the ocean to feed on algae growing on rocks in the ocean. This is how this is how wild the tortoise, uh, the animals on the Galapagos Islands are. They do stuff that no one else does it's it's crazy uh, and you guys may also have heard of the galapagos tortoise they're kind of a uh, a really really old lived species so there's many spe there's many specimens of these tortoises that are still alive from when darwin was there back in the 1850s really long lived really really slow really really cool organisms but the galapagos islands is we could talk about this all day but it's it's a really cool set of islands lots of unique creatures but by far the least unique of all these creatures is Darwin's finches. And so if you've never seen what a finch looks like, you've, and you, well, if you never knew what a finch looked like, you've definitely seen one. They're all over the place in Boston. They're all over the place in Massachusetts, all over the country, all over the world. They're everywhere. But Darwin's finches from the Galapagos, again, they're not particularly exciting looking birds. You know, they have some coloration to them, but they just look like finches. And what Darwin did is he collected 31 specimens of these finches from three of the Galapagos Islands. Remember, there's 13 islands, so he only did three of them. 
Now, just as a note, Darwin was not an expert on birds, so he wasn't he didn't really know too much about birds and their behavior, but he got interested in these birds because they were all on an island together. So what he did is he took them back to England for identification. And what he did is he was told by some uh, by some colleagues that were that were experts on birds um, that uh, they were closely related to um, a group of distant related species on the European mainland. And all these species, as you can see, they don't look all that different. But what differed really strongly, and I hope that's pretty evident from this picture, is their beaks. Their beaks are wildly different. You got this big monster, and you got this teeny tiny little beak here. Um, just as a note, there are there is 14 species of these finches on the Galapagos Islands um, now currently recognized. But what's the big deal with finches? Like, why would you base one of the most, well, he didn't know he was basing the most important theory of all, uh, in terms of biology on finches, but that's what ended up happening. He took a simple organism and he based a huge theory. And the thing about the Galapagos Islands and these the traits of these birds is their traits were physically linked to their food. And so the Galapagos Islands had a really nice array of foods um, from cacti, from large seeds, small seeds, insects, uh, insects living in trees, and they had this really wide diversity of food. But the thing about it was, if you're going to eat a specific type of food as a finch, you need a specific type of beak. So for instance, if you have this very large beak here, you can imagine that large beak probably isn't beneficial to try to get an um, a, a insect out of a tree or try to eat tiny seeds off a cactus. But what that big beak is really good for is cracking larger nuts, right? So your, your beak size, your trait, was related to food in the Galapagos finches, which was nice for Darwin. He could link what the birds were doing to a physical characteristic. And the finches themselves, they ate, as I mentioned, ate a diversity of food. But what Darwin hypothesized is that different beak shapes were related to food. And that natural selection, which is his process, had shaped the beaks according to food source. And Darwin remarked, he says, one might really fancy that one species has taken and modified for different ends. And what he's talking about modifying is modifying the beak, right? He's modifying the beak, or I'm sorry, the, in the, the population is modifying the beak to suit the food source, right? Big beaks, good needs. Tiny beaks, good for something else. So traits in this case were linked to food. So based on this linkage of traits to behaviors, so what you're eating, he came up with three conditions for natural selection as a process. So these three conditions are phenotypic variation must exist in a population. And phenotypic variation, if you've never heard of what that is, phenotypic is just physical characteristics. That's all. Anytime you hear phenotype, it's just a physical characteristic. We'll hear about phenotypes later in the semester when we talk about genetics, but um, it's just a physical characteristic. The second rule is that variation in the population, the, so that variation in traits that I just mentioned, must lead to differences among individuals in the, their lifetime reproductive success. So what, it, what that means is if I have a trait, it might make me better or worse at finding a mate and having more children. Because the idea with biology is, you want to mate and have children because that's really all life is about for natural organisms, right? They don't go on and get jobs and have aspirations, right? All they want to do is survive, mate, have babies, and then die. And that's the flow of life. I know that's kind of nihilistic to think about, but that's 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 life. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, uh, phenotypic variation among individuals must actually be genetically transmissible to the next generation. So it has to have a level of heredity to it. I have to be able to pass my traits on from point A to point B. So from, my, from myself to my offspring. Um, just as a note, genetics hadn't been discovered yet. Um, in, so Darwin didn't have like genetics or genes or DNA to talk about yet. But um, this is what he's referring to as genetics. It has to be genetically passable. Uh, and we'll talk about this genetics later in the semester. And then the final thing he also put forth is that evolution was a very, very, very slow process, that it would take millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years for evolution to occur. So these are what Darwin put forth. There's, there's variability in traits within a population. There's variations lead, must lead to differences in the, in the individuals in terms of their reproductive success. And these traits have to be inheritable. 
They have to be passed, be able to pass down to the next generation. And if you ever wonder like what is phenotypic variation looks like, next time you're in a room of people at like Starbucks or something like that, look around the room. Look at look at hair color, texture, eye color, height, skin color, skin uh, contour, nose size, any trait you can think of. You'll see, even though we're all the same species in the human population, there's a huge variability of traits, even within the same town. So just just as a note, just when you ever think about like, does do traits really vary? Yeah, they do. Just just look at look at what humans are doing. Now, I want to talk about this idea of evolution being slow because it's not a really actually a, a, an accurate concept. Darwin was wrong on this part. Evolution isn't always slow. It can be slow, but it generally actually isn't from what we know. And so this this leads us to another story from the Galapagos Islands, which is the, which is the Grants, Peter and Rosemary Grant. And what they did is they studied medium ground finches on an island of the Galapagos called Daphne Major. And what they did is they found beak depth varied among members of a population, exactly the same the way Darwin found. But one thing they did found is that average beak depth changed from one year to the next in a predictable fashion. So when there was a drought, birds with deeper, more powerful beaks survived better because they were eating large seeds. And then during normal rain season, seasons, the average beak depth increased to its original size, favoring small seeds. Now, without a drought, these birds prefer to eat small seeds. But during a drought, they have to droughts essentially knock out the small seeds. So the birds are forced to eat larger seeds. And if you can eat larger seeds, i.e. you have the trait to eat larger seed, i.e. a bigger beak, means you'll be more reproductively successful, pass on your genetic information to the next generation. Now, I mentioned this, this is an example of fast evolution, and, and I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. But this is a, there is even faster cases of evolution. So if you have about three minutes of your time, uh, please hop on over to this website and watch this YouTube video. Um, so it, well, it's not really a YouTube video, but just watch this video here. Um, it's about evolution in bacteria and antibiotic resistance. It's a really, really cool video. It shows how E. coli can evolve antibiotic resistance in 11 days. So even faster than what I'm going to show you right now. So again, if you have a couple minutes, please, 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 please watch this one. It's really, really fascinating. So what the grants saw is that, um, oh, wow, this uh, this got, I don't know why this is blurry. Um, what the grants saw is that over a very short period of time, when there was a drought, you would see an increase in the average beak's depth. So this, the y-axis is beak depth, the x-axis is time. And you would see over a few year period, the beak size would increase because of the drought, again, favoring the presence of only large seeds. So thus favoring the reproductive success of with larger beak sizes. And then you could see, you know, in between the drought and the non-drought years, beak size stayed large, but once the drought led up, the, as you can see, the drought was very long. It was almost five years, a really long drought. Um, once the drought let up, you see beak size start to decrease back to the levels that were before the drought happened. So again, the environment is selecting for a food source, which then in turn selects for beak size. So year to year changes in average beak depth represent an evolutionary change resulting from natural selection. Pretty cool, right? I think it's cool. So that's our um, that's our Galapagos Islands. Let's talk about a few more cases of natural selection here. So we're going to talk about peppered moths. So when the environment changes, natural selection does favor those with different traits in a species. Very common. And remember, natural selection is not like um, it's not a directed force, right? Natural selection is not trying to make something win. All natural selection is here's the environment, and the environment um, dictates that certain things will do better. That's an important thing, right? It's not like an intelligent thing. It's not like, oh, I want you to live because I like you. It's like, hey, here's the conditions. If you can't adapt to the conditions, bye-bye. That's what natural selection is. Now, the peppered moths, which are uh, Biston uh, batiliare, um, they come in a range of shades. And their body color, just as a note, is controlled by a single. And there is um, uh, the color can either be white or black, and I'll, and I'll show you what that looks like right here. So the moths can either be black or white like this, or some in-between level of black and white. But uh, the black individuals were very, very rare in the population until the 1850s. And for those of you that know your history, 1850s is the Industrial Revolution. So we went from, you know, animal and man-powered things to machine-powered things and the combustion of coal, right, and fossil fuels. After the 1850s, our black individuals, which previously were very rare in the population, 
uh, increased in their frequency um, near industrial centers to essentially be 100% of the population. So the idea being is the industrial revolution um, brought this along. Now, normally speaking, our moths look like this. Um, and this is a great way to blend into a natural environment. But when you start to cover things in soot, a moth that is like this sticks out like a sore thumb. So this was the dominant form of the moth. This was the rare form of the moth. But once the Industrial Revolution hit and turned everything into black mess like this, well, it was no longer favorable to be white. It was now favorable to be black. Because you can imagine, if I'm a moth, I'm going to get eaten in five seconds if I look like this. But if I'm a moth that looks like this, well, I'm pretty well camouflaged. So a, a, a scientist named J.W. Hutt hypothesized that light color moths declined because of predation, because they couldn't hide anymore, and because they were just being easily seen by birds. So this human, this human event changed the environment. And what the environment did is said, well, if you are this color, you're more likely to survive. Thus, you're more likely to pass on your genes to the next generation. This is a favorite ones. I like this. I like this moth case. Um, this is a simplified version of it, but if you want to look up into the whole thing, it's a pretty cool uh, story of genetics and 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 um, um, genetics and uh, ecology together. Now, uh, this leads us to this concept is actually called industrial melanism, and this is uh, which in which darker individuals come to predominate over light ones, um, and pollution resulted in bark color. Um, if we started to control the pollution, it would result in bark color becoming lighter again, which would result in lighter color leopard moths becoming dominant again in the population. So you can, you can essentially turn off the pollution switch, and you can reverse the changes to it. And this, uh, if you want to look this up, it's called industrial melanism. It's, a, it's kind of a fun kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> next up in terms of, of natural selection and pollution is artificial selection. And this is very, very similar to na natural selection, it's just done by humans. So when, when humans put an evolutionary selective pressure on an individual, we can cause them to change. Because very much like nature, we can, we can spawn animals and select for certain traits that allow those animals or plants to do better in a given environment. The idea being is that humans favor certain traits with certain, tr uh, certain, sorry, certain individuals with traits that are beneficial to humans. And what we do is we we only select those individuals that we like, right? So that maybe it's a a big uh, a big corn plant or a corn plant that tastes really tasty. We select for those individuals, and we only allow those ones to pass on their genes to the next generation. And this very strong selection by humans um, leads leads to a very strong evolutionary change, very much like natural selection does. It just artificial selection typically happens faster than natural selection. So the best example I can give you is actually corn. So this is modern corn. You guys know it. Uh, you probably love it, even if you don't eat corn, because every, corn isn't everything. This is what modern corn looks like. But this is what the wild relative of corn, teosinte, looks like. And so by selecting for teosinte that had traits that we liked, and allowing that one to breed, we essentially pushed corn to evolve from this sort of kind of meager looking plant into this monster of a corn cob that we eat now. Just as a note, teosinte um, uh, little cobs are only about three inches in length. Uh, a big corn on the cob, as you guys know, can be close to oh, and over a foot long. So it's a big change. Again, it's all because humans are selecting for traits that we like. Um, another one that you guys are also probably familiar with is in terms of artificial selection is domestication. And so this is human imposed selection on dogs, cats, pigeons, and anything else you can think of that is like livestock, right? And you can think about the dogs as a great um, example of this. We have the wolf is the, the, the ancestor of our, all of our modern day dogs. But you know, there are, I think there's about 250 breeds of dogs, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that. I think there's 250. But all humans did is once we got the wolf living near us, we just selected for traits that we liked. And one of the traits that we selected for very early on was actually docility, because wolves are pretty aggressive. So we selected for wolves less aggressive. And then once we got less aggressive wolves that were living with us, well, we started selecting for traits that we liked, whether it's smallness, whether it's bigness, whether it's intelligence, right? Whether it's the capacity to hunt. 
right? Or start selecting for traits that are just cruel. Like I know French French bulldogs are adorable, but their snouts are so small that they have all sorts of problems breathing and all sorts of problems with their heart. Again, all because we selected for traits that we liked. And this is what domestication is. Humans selecting traits in animals, not just agricultural ones, but you know, friendly ones um, for things that we like. And it leads to some interesting things, you know, something like a, a greyhound is very, very different than a chihuahua, but they're still the same species. And you can, I'm sure there's probably a, a chihuahua greyhound hybrid out there somewhere. It probably looks weird. Anyways, so that's, um, that's natural selection. Remember, it can be done by humans, and it, in which case it's artificial selection, but when it's done by nature, it just changes the environment, selecting for traits that allow an organism to survive better in an environment and reproduce and pass on its genes to the next generation. That's all, that's all we're talking about. It's a very, very simple concept, but it's very, very easy to misunderstand. So that's how it works. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what, what's, what's the evidence? Well, how, do we, how do we know evolution is a thing? Well, let's talk about it. Well, well, first look at fossils, and so fossils are preserved remains of once living organisms, so it's their bones typically. Um, they get calcified and hardened. Um, it's typically when the organism gets buried in sediment and it's turned into, again, calcium and bone is turned into hard tissue uh, and, and, and mineralized, so it turns into like essentially rock. You, got, you guys have probably all seen Jurassic Park. You've probably seen, a, you've probably seen what a fossil looks like at some point in your life. Now, um, <clears throat> fossilization is um, not a, a perfect thing. Not everything can be fossilized. So you can't fossilize hair. You, you know, you can't fossilize tissue, but you can fossilize bone. So, you know, they're, they're, um, they're not perfect, but they work well. And um, fossils, foss, fossilization as an event is, is a little bit rare. Um, so fossilization, they think, occurs about one in every one million skeletons that dies, um, but it's kind of hard to estimate. So if you're interested in that idea of why fossilization is rare, I recommend you taking a peek at this article. It's actually a really fascinating read um, about why fossilization is rare. Um, but once you do have a fossil, of, again, a, a fossil is something that has been long dead. Fo the process of fossilization takes millions of years to occur. So you can't have fossils from 10,000 years ago. Um, we need fossils from, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of years ago. And we can date a fossil by looking at isotopes, uh, in particular, look at potassium isotopes present in the organism. Now, what we're looking at for fossils is what we call evolutionary transitions. Now, as I mentioned, the likelihood of fossil preservation and even the likelihood of us finding that said fossil, even if it did get preserved, is very, very rare. So fossil records are inherently incomplete. And that's just the way fossil records are. And it's just, we haven't, we can't dig up every lot in the planet, right? And we just, we can't, right? We can't dig up the whole planet. So we're never going to find all the fossils. So fossil records themselves are inherently incomplete. Um, and they are, there are large gaps and it depends on what type of, um, you know, species you're looking at. Some gaps are huge. Some gaps are small, but um, there are gaps. Now, there are, when we look in the fossil record, we do see intermediate forms that demonstrate how major transitions have occurred from ancestor to the modern day living relative. So for instance, we can look at a very known, very, uh, very old bird fossil, Archaeopteryx. Um, and you can see this, this is the fossil of it. You know, it's, it's this sort of this odd organism, right? It looks like a bird because it, you can see it's, you know, the outlines of its wings were um, put forth. It's got the structures for wings, but it clearly also looks like a dinosaur. It just, it doesn't quite look like a chicken, right? It does like a dove. It's, it's, it's big, right? So it looks like an intermediate between a bird and a dinosaur. And what it does possess, it possesses the, the characteristics of ancient dinosaurs. So, you know, the structures of the dinosaurs and the size of the dinosaurs. But like modern day birds, it possesses many of the characteristics of modern day birds. Uh, this includes not just the feathers, but it also includes bone structures, structures of the wings and stuff like that. So it has this intermediate. So this is what we call an evolutionary transition, where a fossil shows evidence of being, you know, a mixture of modern day individuals and older fossils. Um, <clears throat> and that's so sometimes um, in terms of intermediate traits, um, some intermediate fossils exhibit some traits their ancestors uh, and
in their descendants. And so, for instance, um, there are four-legged aquatic mammals that we know of. Um, and when I say four-legged aquatic mammals, it's like they live in the water all the time, but they have four legs. So there are fossils of organisms that we know lived in the ocean, but have four legs. And what we think is this is an important link in the evolution of whales and dolphins from land-dwelling and actually hooved ancestors. So if you didn't know the way marine mammals evolved, we left mammals left the well animals left the ocean, mammals evolved, and then marine mammals like dolphins and whales are just a result of going back from going to the ocean from the land. So it's kind of a weird thing to think about. Um, so four-legged aquatic mammals, great evolutionary transition between whales and their land-dwelling ancestors. We also know that there are fossilized snakes that have legs. So before snakes lost their legs, they had an ancestor that had legs. So think about a snake with legs. It's kind of a weird thing to think about, but there was an, there's fossils of that. Um, there's what we call the Tikalik, I think they say it, Tikalik. I'm not really sure. Um, it's a species that bridges the gaps between fish and the first amphibians. Um, and um, we also have oysters, which have um, small curved shells and large flat shells. So they, they're an evolutionary bridge between different types of bivalves. Uh, and just to sort of show you what I mean, we know that uh, modern day whales, their skeleton looks like this, and it looks like this. We know that there is a, um, a fossilized version, um, Roto. Um, I'm going to try. Uh, it has very similar characteristics as the whale. It was it was aquatic, but it had legs. And not just the the legs that have become now flippers. It had actual physical legs and hind legs. So we can see this evolutionary transition. Because remember, we started on the land, and then this in, in, in this one went back to the sea. Pretty cool. Another great example of an evolutionary transition is horses. So modern which are just horses, are, are all large, they're long-legged, fast-running, and they're adapted to life in open grasslands. But the first horse was short, small, with tiny legs. Now, just picture a short, tiny horse, and you're probably thinking of something adorable. But these horses, instead of living in grassland, likely lived in wooded habitats, so like forests. And the path to modern horses involved changes in size, changing the toaster, and changing in the tooth size and shape. Because when you move from uh, the, the forest to a grassland, you need different traits, right? The environment is not going to be particularly nice to you if you have traits of living in the forest, if you're living in the savanna. Um, <clears throat> there also are, we can see adaptations in the horses to climate change because grasslands themselves became much more expansive. And the rates of evolution have varied. So let's look at what we're, what we're looking at here. So modern day horses are all the way here on the, on the far right of our diagram here, this large phylogenetic tree. And we're looking back in, in pretty far. So, you know, modern horses have existed for about 5 million years. As we go back, we're going back to about 55 to 60 million years ago. And we can see that the very first ancestor of horse arose somewhere around 57 million years ago. And you can see the evolutionary progression from the earliest types of horse progressing through the years, getting larger and larger and larger, until we have the more modern sort of sized horse. The clearest thing you can see in these horses is they do share a lot of characteristics, right? Their faces look the same, their legs, their body structure, right? But the clearest thing we're seeing is a transition in these feet. So we're starting, modern horses just have one giant toe, right? Their hoof, all right? And that hoof is great for running on open fields like horses like to do. And not just like to do, they kind of have to do, right? Now, <clears throat> um, what we're seeing here is over time, the hoof is becoming just one toe or else side toes as, again, as we go back in evolutionary history, we're adding even more side toes. And then by the time we get back here, we're getting longer and more developed side toes. So now we're down to three here, much larger side toes. And eventually the very earliest ancestor of modern horses, um, these horses had essentially four toes. So much more like, kind of like a paw almost. But you can see the evolutionary transition of, of how the, the physical foot was selected for by the environment. Now you might ask yourself, well, how do we get that? How do we get the horse to change its foot? Well, remember, even in a population where your feet look like this, 
there is natural variability, right? There are some toads that look more closely related to this than they do this. And that's just a natural thing in the population. So the environment selects for traits that are better. So if you're moving towards a grassland, it's better to have a toad that looks like this than it does to look like this. So the environment was selecting for toads that were looking more like this. So we would start pushing towards, again, more towards that modern type of foot of modern horses. And along with those came an all, uh, a sort of a slew of other different things, including greater size, um, more muscular, things like that, as well as the change in diet, right? You can imagine, you know, forest horses are eating, are eating um, uh, branches, um, but modern day horses eat grass, right? And to eat different grasses, you need different traits to do that. And I think, I think the horse is sort of a fantastic look of different horses. Uh, another interesting case we can actually look at is homologous structures. And these are structures with different appearances and functions that have all derived from the same body part in a common ancestor. And the best example we like to give of this is actually the arm or the wing or the, the leg of either a human, cat, bat, porpoise, or horse. Now, what you can see is all these animals, despite the fact they, they live and do very different things, have the same conserved structure. They have a humerus, a radius, an ulna, um, sometimes fused, but humans have uh, ulna and radius, and they have the carpals, metacarpals, and the phalanges. That's the conserved structure across all of these organisms. But what you'll notice is that even though we all have humerus, they, they're slightly differently shaped, right? Cats are, you know, similar to us, but they're very, very different than a bat, which is very, very thin and narrow. And they're certainly very different than a porpoise, which, again, you can imagine if you're, you know, your upper arm bone, if you're a swimmer, it's better to look like a porpoise's than it is to say look like a, yours. Um, and then you can look at all the other parts, right? The radius and ulna, right? We're the only people with the radius and ulna. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. Us and porpoises have radius and ulna, but cats and bats and horses have a fused radius and ulna, so they have one bone but it's still the radius and ulna. And then you can look at the structure of the hands, or the, in this case of the bat, the wings, or the paws, or the hoof, or the uh, flipper of the porpoise, right? Similar structures. And so what it tells us is that something in the, these are all mammals, right? Bats and horses and cats and porpoises are all mammals. So what this implies to us is that there was some ancestor to all six, all five of these organisms that had this basic arm structure plan, or leg structure plan, if you think about cats. And all that happened is, is that ancestor had it. And as these lineages started to branch off because they started to live in different environments, well, natural selection selected for, mu for different traits that pushed them towards their modern day structures. Um, <clears throat> and um, another sort of kind of a fun homology we can look at is actually um, embryonic homology. And this is actually some of the strongest anatomical evidence supporting um, evolution. And so we can actually look at embryos um, across a couple of different organisms. So we have humans, chickens, tortoises, salamanders, fish. We can look at how our embryos develop for all embryonic organisms as we move from early to mid to late or mature embryo or fetus. And you can look at how this transition occurs. And it's actually really heavily conserved across all species. When you look at almost all species of mammals and animals, this transition is pretty much conserved across the board. It's really wild to look at. It's, it's sort of interesting. Up until about, um, I want to say about 14 weeks, it's almost indistinguishable between a, a human and a salamander or a chicken. It's really wild um, when you actually physically look at these things um, as well. Um, and it's sort of actually an interesting thing is um, uh, early human embryos actually have um, specific types of glands and gills, but we lose them over oh, as our our, um, our fetuses start to develop. Again, we don't have gills, but you know, um, our, our fish friends do. And what this implies is that the ancestor of all of us, again, had an embryo, but need gills. So we, even though we still have them early on, we lose them as our embryos start to develop. I don't know. I don't know about you guys. I find this, this absolutely wild about how things change over, how things are so similar. Um, Again, there are subtle differences, but the, the, the plan, actually the underlying genetics is actually really similar too. So, 
Um, and then finally, um, well, actually, we have two, uh, two last things, I should say. The next one is vestigial structures. And there are structures that have no apparent function, but resemble structures that the ancestors likely to are have likely to process. So I'll give you a couple examples. So manatees actually have fingers on their flippers. Um, and so man remember, manatees are marine mammals. So they came from land. Um, so all marine mammals were once on land and they came into, into the sea. And they still have fingers. <laughs> Clearly you don't need fingers to swim if you have a flipper, but manatees still have um, these vestigial fingers. Um, Boa constrictors have hip bones. So, you know, boa constrictors, they're just the snakes. They don't physically have legs because snakes don't have legs, but boa constrictors still have vestigial hip bones. And humans have a number of vestigial things, including our tailbone. Uh, we have muscles for wiggling our ears, which serves no purpose for humans. There are our, um, we have an organ that is vestigial. Our um, appendix is vestigial, though. It's becoming important for other things now we're learning, but humans also have vestigial structure. So things that our ancestors has, but we're actually starting to lose their function, right? In the case, I like, I like, the, I like the manatees with fingers. <laughs> I think it's just, it's just funny to look at. And then finally, we can have what's called convergent evolution. So convergence, uh, in this case, we have convergence of body structure and uh, swimming mechanics between marine predators. So we have a shark, a tuna, a neosaur, which is a uh, extinct um, marine predator, and a dolphin. All these animals have a very similar body plan. They have very similar streamlined body shape to maximize movement and minimize friction within the water. And so this is convergent evolution. A great, another great example of this is the evolution of flight. We know flight has evolved multiple times. We know the way that birds fly and the way that bats fly, that is two distinct times, but it's very similar. They're doing the same thing. They're evolving similar structures, but they're two completely different groups of organisms. And that's the same thing here. Sharks and tunas are very, very different than dolphins in an evolutionary perspective. So um, all life, as uh, sort of a wrap of this, all life descended from a common ancestor, but these, it's all with modification based on natural selection. Remember, natural selection is the environment selecting. It's, remember, it's not a, it's not like a directed thing, right? And natural selection is not trying to accomplish something. It's just simply the environment is changing. And because there's a diversity of traits within a given population, the environment selects for traits that allow those organisms to do better in a new environment and thus pass on their genetics, thus making their offspring also likely to have those beneficial traits. That's what we're talking about here. And evolution itself is a tried and true theory. Um, and it is, it is really a central theme for biology. Everything we're going to talk about this semester, everything we're going to talk about in general biology too, evolution is a core theme. So you would do yourself a world of good to get this down pat right now, um, because it is it is it is um, it is an important theme. It's not difficult, but it can be easily misunderstood, and the misunderstanding of it you see it all the time in popular culture and things like that. Um, and there's this really nice quote by uh, Dobonsky. He says, "Nothing in biology makes sense except for in the light of evolution." And he is absolutely right. Molecular biology, genetics, chemistry. Uh, population ecology, grassland, right? Nothing makes sense without evolution. And uh, if you have a few minutes, this is a fantastic um, resource to take a peek at, um, looking at uh, evolution uh, as a as an idea. So, so that's going to be it for our evolution. So today's exercise, we're going to be doing just a very simple exercise together. So what I'm going to do is randomly assign you guys into groups. Um, I'll stay in the uh, main study room and uh, I'll pop in and say hi as you know the class progresses. And so what, what you're going to do is discuss some questions posted to this week's folder, and you're going to post the answers after discussing it to this week's discussion board. It's on Blackboard. Um, and once you do that, you're all done with me. So you can go outside and enjoy the nice weather if you're here in Boston or it's like elsewhere, but it's nice in Boston. Um, and that's it. So in terms of where you find this, let me just um, share with my screen. So I'm in week three, September 21 to the 27th. And we're looking at the evolution and scientific thinking exercise. It's a pretty simple exercise. You work in groups of, it says three, but I'm going to break you. Uh, I don't, let me see how many people are here. So there's 24 of you. So I'll probably break you into, yeah, I'll break you into, that's, well, I'll break you into groups of four. Yeah. Um, and uh, 
what you're going to do is answer these questions. So there's, there's one, two, three of them. Well, well, the third one has multiple parts to it. And once you answer those questions, you're going to mosey on over to the in-class activities board here on the left-hand panel. You're going to click on evolution discussion board and create a new thread, and you're going to post your discussion to this board. So just, you know, so I can see your thinking on the matter, seeing how you are understanding this. Um, remember, the, you know, your participation in these is a part of your grade, so you kind of have to do it. I guess you don't have to do it, but, you know, it's part of your grade, so you probably should do it. When you do post this to us, make sure you, um, you can um, just make sure you put all the names of people that are working together. Um, you don't have to post a comment. You can just copy and paste this information directly into uh, a discussion board. So it's, you guys, you guys already did it once when you posted a discussion board introducing yourself. So you're kind of familiar with the topic right now, or not with the topic, with the idea of how to do it. So does anybody have any questions before we break out? Let's see. Randomly assigned. One, two, six groups. Okay, so once I get to your group, it's automatically going to send you away from me. I know you're gonna, that's going to make you sad. But, uh, you know, you have uh, until 4 o'clock to do this. Um, that's because that's when our recitation ends. Um, if you guys are having any, like I said, I'll pop in and out of these as uh, the, the period progresses to answer any questions. But you can obviously raise your hand um, inside your group to call me in. Or you can ask, a, um, you, can ask you know, a question in the group in the main chat and I can, or any actually even in your uh, group chat and I can see it as well. So I will see you guys shortly. <laughs>